Good morning again and good afternoon to wherever you are uh, located, to everybody, wherever you're located. Thank you again for joining. This is time for us to get started and uh, special war warm welcome to those who are joining us from Canada. Thank you for joining. In today's agenda, we have really full agenda for the next uh, about four hours. We'll start with the a, a brief introduction of the project that I will give. And uh, then we will get uh, updates on the work that was done uh, over the past year on each of the project objectives. Then we'll end with a stakeholder summaries or reports from stakeholders based on what they experienced during the last year with SWG. And tomorrow our agenda is primarily based uh, on uh, objective for every objective we will present plans for the uh, research and extension activities for next year and we will also have a special time allocated for stakeholders to provide feedback on our plans thank you again for joining and i will start now with a brief introduction sort of an overview of the project as, as you all know, this is the third SCRI project since the uh, first detection of SWD in the mainland US in, in, in California. First project was led by uh, Vaughn Walton out of Oregon State. Uh, the second project was, the first project was primarily West Coast based because at the time issue was more on the West Coast. Later, the second SCRI project was led by Hannah Brock out of NC State at the time. There was more national project. And then this is the third project that uh, I am leading again. This is a national effort with the 11 land grant universities and USDA scientists. The goal is to develop more long-term sustainable management programs to control SWD in key fruit crops in the U.S. and beyond. This map basically shows overall distribution of SWD. There's no doubt it's, it is everywhere, wherever we have a small food production in the U.S. and it has spread throughout the world basically in major food producing regions. Spotted wing Drosophila, it is really, uh, it's a Drosophilid fly, of course, which uh, develops really fast. As you can see, it can, uh, females have this very unique ovipositor that they use to lay eggs in fruit. Larvae develop inside the fruit to pupate, and then adults come back and start their process again. This whole process of development from egg through adulthood it can happen in eight to 10 days at 25 degrees centigrade. So that it can go through several generations during one field season and can build up populations to cause a huge impact on crops. Estimates of the crop losses were based on surveys uh, or uh, show about $718 million in crop losses and $129 uh, in management costs, these estimates are uh, is a, a little bit old. They were in to, made in, 20, in 20, 2014. Since then, the impact may have increased. So primary goal of the project is to develop and deliver systems-based integrated pest uh, management programs to berry and cherry growers that are cost-effective and environmentally sustainable for the long-term management of SWD. Specific, uh, this is actually, this slide shows the project team where uh, we have uh, researchers from 11 land grant universities, including University of Georgia, Florida, NC State, Oregon State, Michigan State, UC Davis, UC Berkeley, Cornell, Rutgers University, University of Maine, Washington State University and USDA ARS. We have a large team of researchers from most of the regions wherever we have small food production included in the project. The goal is to make sure we, we, we reach out to all stakeholders across the country. 
the specific, we have five objectives. The first objective is implementation of best management programs for sustainable management of uh, SWD in collaboration with growers uh, and influencers. Um, this project is led by Hannah Brock and uh, now at uh, Michigan State University, Hannah Levinson at uh, NC State and Vaughn Walton at Oregon State. Object, our uh, second objective is to develop economics-based disseminate tools to uh, support the identification and implementation of profit-maximizing SWD management strategies. This is led by Miguel Gomez and Karina Gallardo. Um, uh, these are two economists uh, supported by Greg Loeb and Tobin Northfield. Objective uh, three is uh, two parts. First part is evaluating sustainable alternatives to long-term management, management of SWD focusing on biological control. And this biological control aspect is led by uh, Kent Dana and Chen King. Um, and the second part is uh, develop uh, economically viable behavioral tools, which is led by Cesar Saona out of Rutgers University. Objective four is to assess and reduce the risk of insecticide resistance development. And this is led by Joanna Cho from UC Davis and Rufus Isaacs from Michigan State University. And the last objective is to develop and disseminate actionable recommendations that enable producers to optimize pest management decisions and evaluate their impact. This project is led by uh, Kay Kelsey at the University of Florida. She leads all of our evaluation uh, uh, efforts uh, for, for the team and myself, uh, Ash Sayal at University of Georgia, I do uh, most of the lead, most of the extension efforts that we have. Again, everybody is involved in this project. And so with this, uh, a large team of researchers, we do have a large team of uh, stakeholders that uh, we always consult in terms of advising on research and extension objectives. This shows a list of the stakeholders that have been involved with this project since the beginning of this project as members of the advisory board. And we will get some of the updates from stakeholders later today and also get their input on our plans tomorrow. So this is sort of an outline of the project. And now I will pass on to Hannah Levinson. I believe she is going to uh, present the objective one for uh, an update on objective one for us. Hannah. Thanks, Ash. Hi, everyone. So, yeah, I'll be sharing the update for objective one. And since this is our last big annual meeting to provide updates, I wanted to walk through where we started with objective one at the beginning of the project and how we've built up to where we are now doing the work we did in 2023 and what we'll do in 2024. So I'll go through a brief recap. So here's the three objective one co leads. Uh, if you want more information or need more details, feel free to contact us um, and I know this is quick, so I'll put this up at the end if you need more time to get our information down. So as Ash just said, the main goal for objective one was to develop and implement best management programs for sustainable management of spotted wing drosophila in collaboration with grower influencers. So the key thing here for objective one was really making sure we were working with growers when we were making research plans so that we were directly addressing concerns and questions that you all had, but also so that the results from our research could be directly helpful and implemented by you all. So that was really key. And what that ended up being for objective one was that we really focused on developing management tools. Uh, that was a big part of making these management programs more sustainable. So why monitoring is important. I'm sure I don't have to tell you all, um, but spotted wing populations are variable. They can change depending on the crop type you're working in, depending on the location around the world, but also even within a state. 
um, and also the time of year. And so this makes spotted wing pretty difficult to control at times. Because of that, pesticide use has increased, which can lead to some negative impacts. So you'll hear more about this later, about evidence of pesticide resistance forming. There's also concerns about secondary pest outbreaks and negative effects on beneficial organisms. So one tool to work on uh, minimizing these negative impacts is having really good monitoring methods so that you can know exactly when and where to to target your sprays. So the main types we focused on um, from the beginning of the project are shown here. So first we were looking at liquid traps to monitor for adult fly populations through our own research, but also through feedback from you all, we have found that these traps can be a little bit difficult to process. They can collect a lot of bycatch, which means you need to take time to process them. Many times you need to look under the microscope to identify what you're looking at, and that can be expensive. But also once you process it, we've all seen that uh, the results you get out of these adult traps don't always correlate as well with the larval infestation in the berries. So they may not be providing the best information. And so because of this, we focused on a couple other monitoring tools. And what I'll talk about today are first um, dry traps or these red sticky cards you can see in that middle picture to also monitor adults, but these focus on males because they have those distinct spots on their wings and they can be identified with the naked eye. But then also looking at the real time infestation in fruit, actually looking at what larvae are in there through fruit sampling. So first I'll talk about what we've done with fruit sampling. The idea here was using fruit sampling to improve management programs. And specifically, we wanted to address some of these big questions. How do we use this to help decide when to start making pesticide applications? Once you start, how do we know where in the field or where across a farm to apply applications? And then how do we use this to adjust our harvest schedule? So the first thing we did um, for this project was actually building on information that came from some of our research partners on work they did prior to this grant to develop something called the filter method. So the basis of this is you collect fruit, you soak it in a liquid that forces the larva out of the berries. You can then collect those larva and then you get a count of the infestation in your field at that time. So we really like this method. Um, the supplies shown here for the most part are relatively cheap, should be pretty accessible. Um, you can adapt specific um, items in the protocol to your needs. You can also scale this up and down. So it's really flexible and really accessible. And at the very beginning of the project, we wanted to see how this protocol worked for different fruit types. So in 2021 and 2022, we actually worked to optimize this for blueberries, blackberries, strawberries, and cherries specifically. Um, so we are working on writing up the report for this now. So the protocol did get slightly tweaked so that it could be more efficient and also provide better information for each of these crop types. Um, for now, until that report comes out, if you collect fruit, you soak it in one cup of salt per gallon of water for an hour and then count the larvae that come out of that in a reusable coffee filter, you'll get good information and good usable information. But just know that we are, um, we will soon be able to share the optimization we did for each of these fruit types. So once we had that settled, we wanted to compare this to some of our other monitoring ideas. So first I'll talk about a project spearheaded by our Cornell team, where we put out red sticky cards at six different states, two different fruit types, and two different years. So a really huge data set spread across a large geographic area. Um, and we put the sticky cards at a field edge next to a natural area, um, counted the male spotted wing like I talked about, and then compared that to the larva we were seeing using the filter method in the berries. And what we found is that in some locations, we saw this really nice correlation where um, with increasing larva in the berries, we were seeing increasing males on those sticky cards. But unfortunately, in most of the locations that we did this at, there was not a very clear correlation between larva in the fruit, males on the sticky cards. So a couple explanations for why this could be happening. Um, there could be differences across uh, fruit or crop types. There could be differences depending on the location where this was conducted. Weather plays a huge role here in spotted wing populations and infestation levels in the fruit. 
um, other management decisions or what is grown nearby. But the big thing is while you all are necessarily applying pesticides in your fields to try to control spotted wing, that could be blurring the true relationship between when adults are in your field, what larva show up in your berries. So in 2023, we followed up on this to try to get a better idea about what's going on there. Um, and I'll circle back th to that in a second. So the other thing we wanted to know in 2022 was how did spotted wing infestation in the fruit change not only across the whole harvest season, so the entire time you all are harvesting, but also in different locations within a field. So you can see the stars are where we sampled. We sampled at field edges as well as interiors of the field, compared that. We compared it across the whole harvest season using the filter method, so actually getting a count of the larva in the fruit. And this was done at four different states and two different crop types. And what we found is that if we're looking at the edge samples shown with the blue lines in these graphs and comparing that to the interior samples shown with red lines, we see that the edge of the fields get infested earlier, but also at higher levels when compared to the field interiors. And then further, it really depends on the life stage you're looking at. So on the left graph, we see the information shown for the number of eggs per berry and on the right, you see the number of small larva or the first instar larva. And so if you put all this together, if you look at edge samples, you focus on those early life stages. So eggs and first instar larva, you can get up to two weeks of an earlier detection of spotted wing infestation in your fields. So that's really big. It gives way more time to try to figure out the best management action to take, but also controlling these first early season infestations is really important to help control the later season populations and try to push back the exponential growth that can happen for as long as possible. Um, so we're really excited by this information and we actually followed up on this in 2023. So now getting into where we are now and what we did in 2023. So we now optimize the filter method. We understand a little bit more about what's going on across the season, space and time. Um, now that we have, we can collect the fruit, we can get a count of the larva, what do you do with that number? So that's really what we're focusing on now. So we're currently working on de developing a decision tree. So once you get that information, you can walk through the tree and get um, an idea of what action would be best to take. Um, and for time, I won't go into this further now, but we're also thinking about how this can um, go into play with the whole ecosystem on your farm. How can we help protect these beneficial organisms like pollinators and parasitoids? And you'll hear more about parasitoids later today. Okay, so the decision tree, like I said, you do the filter method, you get a count of larva, and the idea is that you get the number from that sample method. And then if you use the tree, you get an action that is recommended to you. If you have a different number at a different time of the year, there's a different action that correlates to that. So because this is still under development, we don't have specifics to share with you now, um, but the work we did in 2023 testing this was done at six different states, two different crop types. And the setup is that on each farm, we had a regular field where the spray program did not change um, as a result of the larval counts we found. You all just went through your normal spray program. And then we had a second field where we were trialing this decision tree. So each week we got a larval count and we went through the tree to come up with a um, action recommendation. And we got some really exciting results. So you can see the different states and what they um, had happen there. So in Georgia, they were able to reduce the spray. Maine was able to focus on perimeter sprays rather than whole field sprays. Michigan was able to reduce one to two sprays. New York reduced the spray as well as focus on perimeter sprays. In North Carolina, we were able to reduce four sprays. And I want to stop for a second and highlight that Oregon has been working on a version of this for quite some time since 2020. And from 2020 to now, they've been able to reduce 10 to 15 sprays during the season, which is really amazing. Um, and Vaughn wanted to share some more details about that. Vaughn, if you're ready right now. Just a minute. Thank you, Hannah. Much appreciated. Um, so this work, I just talked to TJ Hafner this morning. We started working with them uh, already uh, in 2018. So back then we were looking around 20 sprays per season. We reduced it to half of that. 
And in the last two years, we're down to about five sprays per season. And then when you look at that, uh, that decision tree that you have there on the left-hand side, Hannah, we were using that to then also start implementing additional new technologies. We use that uh, methodology for sampling to firstly look at uh, one of the technologies we developed uh, here at OSU, decoy. And now we're also uh, moving towards attract and kill. And you'll see one or two of, of those slides from Cesar uh, this uh, little later this afternoon. And so now our growers are comfortable to look at, uh, at, at these uh, decoy type compounds, these attract and kill. And uh, this hopefully this next season, we'll be looking at two or three attract and kill technologies. So really exciting. Um, I, I think our growers are very excited about this. We're going to be saving hopefully a bit more money on the spray side when we look at these attract and kill technologies in future. And that's all I have at this stage. Thank you, Anna. Great, thanks Vaughn. Yeah, very, very exciting. So we're gonna continue developing this, continue fine tuning that decision tree across all these states. Um, and hopefully we'll have something to share with you all soon. And related to something Vaughn just said, we're also working with our Cornell team to develop um, economic analysis on this. So basically comparing the regular spray program to this reduced, hopefully reduced spray program, but including the costs of sampling and going through this decision tree. So we're also going to have that information for you all. Okay, so quickly I'll share the follow up on the dry traps led by our Cornell team. So in 2023, they repeated this in four states, but they specifically sampled in organic or no spray sites. So still putting out the 10 sticky cards for four weeks, counting the males and comparing that to the larval counts from the filter method. And in doing so, they were able to get better correlations between increasing larva and increasing male counts. So it does seem to be that the ongoing pesticide applications are blurring the relationship between adults in the field and the larva a bit. Um, so glad to see that we can narrow down a little bit more about what's going on and how to really use this tool. Um, so they're working on uh, summarizing up that data now. They're also working with the Cornell team to get an economic analysis of this going so that you all can have that information when you're considering everything. Also in New York, they did an in-person hands-on training to show you all um, like the tips and tricks of using this filter method. Also the trials and errors that we've already been through to hopefully help you all feel more comfortable using this with um, your, your fruit. So they provided supplies to the growers. They also compared researcher and grower counts using microscopes and hand lenses. And so they did find that researchers using microscopes had higher counts. Um, and really from personal experience, but also from other people sharing, it's that first instar, like I showed, it's it's the really important life stage to look at um, to try to catch that early infestation. But it really is the hardest one to to see, and you many times can only do that with a microscope. So we're still working on how to provide training for you all on this, and we're hoping um, to pro provide more training on this. And then the last research project I'll share with 2023 uh, was spearheaded by our team in Washington. So like I just said, it can be difficult to count those small larvae. So the idea here is let's have AI count it for you. Uh, so you still go through the filter method, you get a collection of larvae in that reusable coffee filter, but instead of needing to look at it under a microscope, you can take a picture of the larvae in that filter like you can see there, and then you can use AI to count that. So our Washington team has developed a model. They were able to get 90 to 95% accuracy for detecting second and third instar larva. So really great progress so far. They're also working to develop that into an app. It's about 90% complete for Android. So really exciting and hopefully this can be a really great tool for everyone. Again, the first instar is really tricky. They're still working to improve the first instar detection. Um, that's a big plan for 2024. And then also validating that model they created using images from North Carolina and Georgia. So we had field infested fruit that we ran through the filter method and they're using that um, those images now to optimize this. So really exciting there. 
Okay, so then just to recap of our plans for the next year, continue developing that decision tree, fine tune it for you all, um, continuing to incorporate that into a whole ecosystem approach, trying to protect those beneficials, continuing to develop AI larval counting, and then also hoping to expand and create new training material for you all. Um, so you're more comfortable using the fruit sampling method and coordinating with extension agents. Um, so that's our update for objective one. Um, keep this in mind for our conversation tomorrow. Uh, and we really look forward to hearing from you all. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Anna, for a great update. Appreciate it. And I just wanted to let everyone know that if you have any questions while the presentation is going on, please type it in Q&A and uh, uh, those questions will be answered by one of the team members as we go. Uh, we have one question right now. Uh, if Hanno, if you can take care of that from Jimmy Click, he's asking, what was the larval threshold in the decision tree trials? Do you envision growers using larval monitoring? Excited about the AI to count larvae. Please make it available for iPhone as well. How is a perimeter spray made? Yeah, I can quickly answer that. So the idea with the decision tree is that it needs to be adaptable um, since the situation can be very different across different crop types and across locations. So we're hoping that it can be adaptable for each specific situation. So we're still working on the thresholds and probably the threshold for one person might not be the same for everyone. Um, and then, yeah, I'm sure our Washington team has lots of plans beyond what I shared for AI. And then as far as the perimeter spray goes, um, I'm sure we can hear more from other stakeholders that utilize that, um, but it's where when you're spraying, you don't go down your whole row. You can just focus on the perimeter and especially perimeters next to natural areas. Uh, just a comment about AI uh, is that we are, as a team, we are getting together uh, to discuss the plan for expanding this to multiple states this year. Once we have data from multiple states, we will put push it uh, final information out to stakeholders as soon as uh, it is ready. Thank you. And let's move on to the next objective two. Uh, at this point, and if you have any questions, again, please feel free to type them into Q&A and we'll get them answered as soon as uh, possible. So uh, let's move on to objective two. And uh, our presenters are ready, Karina and uh, Miguel's team. Is it Pingyan? Yes. All right, perfect. All yours. Thank you, Ash. Hello everyone, uh, I'm Bin Yan Dai from Cornell University. Today I'll be representing our team to report our research progress for Objective 2, the economics of um, spoiled wind drop software for you. The Objective 2 is led by PS from Cornell University, Professor Miguel Gomez, Professor Greg Lope, and Professor Karina Gardo from Washington State University. For, for Objective 2, the economics of stability. Our goal is to develop economics-based decision aid tools to support the identification and implementation of profit-maximizing stability management strategies. Specifically, our team evaluates different stability control strategies, including the conventional calendar-based spray strategy, and more importantly, integrated pass management strategies developed by our entomologist in the team. For example, we, we assess the effectiveness of the most recent monetary techniques, such as adult trapping and food sampling, to determine whether adopting these monetary techniques pays off for growers. And additionally, we evaluate the cost effectiveness of other strategies, including exclusion netting and the behavioral controls. The economic analysis of activity management strategies is crucial for growers to gain a better understanding of the cost effectiveness of various approaches and make informed decisions. Moreover, given the negative effect of extensive chemical use, such as water pollution, concerns regarding the food safety and the development of pesticide resistance, 
our research plays a vital role in identifying strategies that are both cost, cost effectiveness and environmentally sustainable. In addition to academic publications and the research findings, our primary output for growers is Excel-based interactive management support tools that enable them to make informed economic decisions at the farm level. For example, for instance, we have developed a decision tour for blueberry growers in North Carolina to assist them in determining whether investing in cold storage to controlling SWD is economically viable. Growers can access this tour on the North Carolina State Extension website. And next, Next, I'm delighted to share the research progress made by our team over the past year. Firstly, we conduct economic analysis, including food sampling as a control strategy for SWD. These analyses were conducted for both organic blueberry production in Oregon State and conventional blueberry production in New York State. We are grateful for the support and assistance from our collaborators and stakeholders in Oregon and New York State. Secondly, building on our analysis in Oregon, our team is in the process of developing an interactive decision tour for growers. This tour aims to aid growers in determining whether adopting food sampling during their farm operations is economically beneficial or not. Thirdly, we are actively involved in developing and implementing a survey tool to elicit consumer preferences for various SWD strategies, taking into account significant external factors such as climate change. Currently, we are working on the data collection. Next, I'll share our main findings and updates for each progress we made last year. Firstly, regarding the economics of incorporating food sampling as a SWD control strategy, we collaborated with our colleagues at Oregon State University, focusing on organic blueberry production in Oregon. Our objective for this analysis was to compare the economic performance, including the revenue, cost, and profit of strategies that incorporate food sampling with other control strategies in decision making. After consulting with our expert and stakeholders, we identified four different control strategies that are of interest to growers and also our entomologists. The first strategy is calendar basis spray, currently practiced by most Oregon growers, where spring occurs every three days. The second strategy is adult trapping based spray control, where grower monitor SWD population through adult trapping at regular intervals and decide whether to spray based on the results. The third strategy is food sampling based spray, similar to the adult trapping approach, where growers use food sampling to monitor SWD population and decide on spraying beside on egg and lava monitoring results. The last strategy combines food sampling based spray with, harvest, with harvesting decisions. In this strategy, growers use monitoring information to guide both spray and harvesting decision. If SWD egg and larva are observed, they spray and harvest the next day. Then we analyzed the cost and the benefit of adopting each of these control strategies for a representative organic and blueberry grower in Oregon State. We consider the true population dynamics of spotted windrow sophila and calculated the, the expected total profit for each strategy available in Oregon. The total profits are determined by the infestation level, yield, management cost for controlling SWD, and the potential change in price if berries are rejected by fresh market and end up in frozen and processing market. Our, our analysis and the results were published in the journal Past, Past Management Science last year. The main findings indicate the control strategies incorporating fruit sampling offer the best economic performance with the highest average profit. 
We also evaluate the performance of the status quo control strategy, which involves spring every three days, commonly practiced by growers in Oregon. This conventional strategy generates higher revenue than all monetary-based strategies. This is because of the high number of sprays, which reduce the rejection rates from fresh market. Growers receive higher price from fresh market than from frozen and processing market. Explaining why the conventional strategy yields higher revenue. However, if we consider the management cost for controlling SWD for this conventional strategy, the cost from the higher numbers of pesticide applications actually offsets the returns. Therefore, the conventional strategy does not yield good economic performance compared to food sampling based control strategies. Then we took a closer look at the economic performance of each SWD strategy. This figure displays the seasonal profits statistics for each strategy we evaluated, highlighting the variation in expected seasonal profit for each strategy. The variation indicates that status quo strategy is the least risky for growers due to the intensive use of pesticides, which keeps the SWD population very low. Therefore, there won't be significant change, change in profit if you use the status quo strategy. However, for st strategies S1 to S4, these monetary-based control strategies could be riskier or more uncertain than the status quo strategy. Nevertheless, the average seasonal profit from food sampling guided spray and harvesting are higher than those from the status quo strategy. This is attributed to timely pesticide application from more accurate monetary and more harvest during the early season when growers could receive a price premium from fresh market. And additionally, we conducted sensitivity analysis on selected model parameters to evaluate these control strategies under scenarios of interest. These two figures provide provided show the total profit of each of these five strategies with different levels of monetary accuracy and also buyer's observation threshold. We observe how the total profit of each strategy change with our baseline scenario and with high efficiency and low efficiency of our monetary method. The figure on the right demonstrate how expected profit would vary if buyers had a higher tolerance or low tolerance for infestation levels in fresh produce. We also examined how changes in growers' action threshold affects the rankings and expected total profit. Some growers may be very risk averse, choosing to spray once they find a single SWD during, during their monetary. On the other hand, some growers may be more tolerant of risk and may not spray until they observe two or three SWD from their samples. Additionally, past pressure plays a significant role. Past pre pressure can vary due to the migration of SWD and microenvironmental climate change in the surrounding area. We analyzed how the chain results change with different levels of past pressure. And also, the efficacy of pesticides can significantly impact your profit as well. For instance, the effectiveness of pesticides might decrease in cases of resistance issues. Therefore, it's essential for us to understand how profit might change with differences in pesticides longevity and efficacy. Moreover, for monetary-based strategies, the frequency of monetary also affects monetary economic outcomes. In summary, it's crucial to, con to consider how these important factors influence SWD management and the cost effectiveness of control strategies. And based on the economic analysis conducted for organic blueberry production in Oregon, we are now developing a decision tour for growers to evaluate monetary-based strategies applicable to their own situations. In this tour, growers will input their own farm characteristics required from, for our analysis. For example, you will pro pro provide the price you receive from the market. 
your production characteristics, such as the expected yield every week, and also the cost incurred for controlling SWD. Once all the information is provided, this decision tool would display the expected economic performance of the control strategies that growers are interested in, including the expected total revenue, yield, total cost, and total profit. And the growers can utilize this decision tool to determine whether they should continue adopting the conventional strategy or switch to the monetary-based strategies. In addition to the analysis conducted for organic blueberry production in Oregon State last year, we also conducted economic analysis for conventional blueberry production in New York State. We collaborated with our colleagues in New York State and identified the following strategies for growers in New York State. The first strategy is the status quo strategy practiced by growers in New York State, weekly spray. Then we explored two approaches for both adult trapping based spray and food sampling based spray. One is monitor to initiate, and another is monitor to, monitor to guide. Monitor to initiate means you start to monitor in the first week of the harvesting season. And once you observe SWD population, you stop the monitoring and spray for the rest of the season. Monitor to guide means every week of the harvesting season, you monitor and you use your monitor results to decide whether you spray or not for that week. The last strategy we evaluate is adult trapping initiated and sampling guided spray. For this strategy, as the beginning of the harvesting season, you use adult trapping to monitor as the woody adult. And you, once you find as the woody, you stopped using adult trapping and from the following week, you monitor the field using fruit sampling and spray based on your monitor result every week. And um, this figure shows our preliminary results for this analysis. It shows the seasonal total cost per acre under different SWD control strategies I explained before, consistent with our analysis in Oregon State. The fruit sampling based control strategies shows better results than adult trapping based control strategies with lower total cost. However, when not considering the negative environmental effect associated with the intensive use of pesticides, the status quo strategy, weekly spray, appears to be the most cost effective strategy for conventional blueberry production in New York State. And we are stu still working on the model and analysis. And we are very looking forward to share our results after we finish it. And all our this analysis underscores the importance of monetary activities for growers. And next, I'll pass to I'll pass on to Karina for our for next progress. Thank you, Minjan. So in What we are doing is to get to understand how consumers will react towards uh, alternative integrated pest management. Next slide, please. No, the previous one. No, the previous slide. That one. How consumers will uh, understand or have any preference for um, <clears throat> uh, different integrated pest management strategies that are uh, consistent or that have been studied for implementation for a spot wind drosophila. This is to um, not have a sole reliance on. Um, chemical application. So these four uh, alternative integrated pest management strategies were uh, gene editing of insects, application of irradiation at the during the storage, and then um, biological control, either application of parasitoids or predators. So how do we explain this to consumers? Well, consumers really do not have much uh, knowledge about these alternatives or much knowledge about agricultural production. 
So we presented a survey in which we explain and we uh, have a very in-depth in -depth explanation of what are these techniques. And then to, to try to elicit what will be if there is any change in behavior for acceptance of perceptions of this alternative integrated pest management to see how their behavior will change if they were increasingly aware of climate change and the needs for um, establishing other controls other than reliance purely on insecticide control. So this survey was um, approved by the Washington State University Inter Institutional Review Board and was implemented during the last week of January. As a matter of fact, just today we finalized the data collection. We uh, surveyed 3,300 respondents across the United States. Uh, and we use a company called Qualtrics in order to survey consumers. Uh, the screening uh, criteria uh, to survey consumers was that they were in charge of the grocery shopping in the household and they have consumed uh, fresh blueberries in the past six months and sweet cherries wedding season, the past season, because right now we are not in season or we cannot see sweet cherries in the supermarket. Uh, to ensure a representative uh, sample of respondents that could be generalizable to the United States, we use age quotas, region quotas, and household income. This is because the panel or the consumer survey research panel that Qualtrics have is a little bit skewed to the 55 plus and to the highest populated areas of the United States and with higher income. So we want to kind of like not have that, only that type of population survey, but a more dispersed and representative of general US population characteristics in terms of age, region, rural versus urban, and household income. So as I mentioned, the survey data has been collected and we are right now in the process of, anal of analyzing the responses. Uh, we have to have a quality checking of the survey respondents and all those quality checkings have been uh, already processed. So we have, we can say that we can have the data to start the analysis and hopefully we can share results in the next weeks or so. Thank you. Thank you very much, Karina and Benyan, for the update. So at this point, we still have a couple minutes. If there are any questions, please uh, feel free to type in, or if you can uh, speak, that will be fine too. Uh, great, thank you. So we're gonna switch over now to objective three. Uh, evaluation of sustainable alternatives for spotted wing management. And the first of these is looking at biocontrol with native and imported natural enemies. So we oftentimes think of these natural enemies as being strictly predators or parasitoids, but it also includes things like nematodes, fungi, bacteria, and our teams working on all the different aspects of biological control to suppress spotted wing drosophila. Now, in the past, we've talked about the work that members of the SCRI and other programs have done looking at generalist predators. So this becomes important, especially when you think about spotted wing drosophila pupa that tend to pupate outside of the fruit, typically on the ground. Predator exclusion trials showed a 19 to 49% reduction of spotted wing larva and a 71, 61 to 91% reduction of pupa by generalist predators. The group has also worked on the augmentation of pupal parasitoids, especially pachycropoideus. Um, these are pupal parasitoids that are resident in North America already, but on their own, they don't supply enough control to really suppress the pests uh, be below our needed levels. So a group working in California, Oregon, and Minnesota looked at the augmentative release of pachycropoideus, a pupil parasitoid. We found some reduction, but not enough to be economically viable. So 
So today's focus is going to be on biocontrol using two Asian species of fidgeted wasps, Gnaspis, which has been called in the past Gnaspis resiliensis, and Leptopolina japonica. Gnaspis is one that we got a permit for to release across the United States. We'll cover some of our release programs. Leptopolina is one that showed up adventively in British Columbia at first, and is now spreading through North America. Both of these fidgeted wasps were selected after importation efforts in Japan, China, and South Korea for being probably some of the better spotted drosophila larval parasitoids. A number of people have been working on releases of Gnaspis and monitoring Leptopolina japonica. Uh, a large group that includes members outside of this current SCRI team. What I'm going to do today is just give updates from the SCRI program on release of Gnaspis, recovery of Leptopolina, and manipulation of both in terms of getting better production out of the insectary or better production in different release areas. So these updates will cover 2022 and 2023. And we've broken down primarily into three areas, production and release of these two fidgeted wasps, monitoring parasitoid presence, and starting now to look at impact across the US. Uh, Shin King in tomorrow's talk will look a little bit into the future and also discuss what impact these might have on spot and wing levels. And then we're also going to cover in a few uh, states, research progress to improve rearing, release, and recovery of these two fidgeted wasps. We'll go clockwise around the US. We'll start uh, in Michigan. Um, in Michigan, we look at the top graph and we see uh, what's important here. So one more. Um, look at the number of different hosts that we've got spot and wing and leptopolina like or fidgeted wasps coming out of. So we've got about 12 different host plants listed here. We're getting Suzukii out of a number of host plants, but look at how the variation goes with the kinds levels of Leptopolina-like wasp we're getting out. Um, also, if we look at the bottom graph, we can see that there's seasonal patterns. Spot and wing is increasing in July, wasp are increasing in August, and both are declining in September. This was consistent in both 2022 and 2023. This is what we also found consistently in our samples in Asia, is that there were patterns of parasitism throughout the season. So we tend to get higher parasitisms towards the end of the season. We tend to get spot and wing coming in first with very low levels of parasitism. So this means that in the future, we should probably consider overwintering, overwintering host plants for both spot and wing and the parasitoid to see if that can't be manipulated. New York, we can see here release areas in the Finger Lake regions of New York. In 2022, about 2,400 Gnaspis released, but they only collected Leptopolina at the different monitoring sites. In 2023, the same number of Gnaspis released, but in this last year, they recovered both Gnaspis and Leptopolina, and we're, pending, we're waiting for confirmation for both of these species. So this is good news showing that Gnaspis is now also being recovered. Remember, Leptopolina has been moving from British Columbia across the US. It has got a wider host range, so it tends to be a little bit better of an invader, a, a better initial establishment parasitoid. That we're getting both is good news. Also in New York, the Cornell team looked at the percent parasitism between uninfested raspberries and infested raspberries, uninfested blueberries and infested blueberries. Surprisingly, the results found no significant treatment impact for either Gnaspis or Leptopolina. Now this is opposite what an earlier study had shown, where in the same kind of a setup, a Y olfactometer, the parasitoids were attracted to fruit that were infested by spotted wing. So this is something we're gonna follow up a little bit more in the future as well. Host 
finding for these parasitoids might also be impacted by the host plant species. Another study in New York uh, from Greg and his team at Cornell was looking at the interspecific competition between Gnaspis and Leptopelina. Since we're releasing Gnaspis, but we're finding Leptopelina in many of these areas, it becomes important to know whether or not these parasitoids will work synergistically together, um, meaning that together they provide better the control than either one separately. We can see here Gnaspis by itself in both blueberries and raspberries, Leptopelina by itself in both blueberry and raspberries, and a combination of Gnaspis and Leptopelina. Uh, the total number of parasitoids were the same in all these treatments. What they found was that uh, together, the two species combination was more effective in suppressing spotted wing than either species alone. And this was especially true in blueberries. So that's good news. Uh, the same thing we found in our Asian collections, that these two species, these two fidgeted wasps work well together. So overall, they lower the density of spot and wing when they're both present, more so than either separately. Going now to Maine, uh, in 2022, they released almost 5,000 Gnaspis across four sites in the state. In the state. And in 2023, about 1,500 Gnaspis released at five sites. They monitored using fruit collections as well as sentinel traps baited with infested uh, blueberries. What they found was fairly similar to what we found in Michigan earlier. Uh, in 2022, a heat wave, no collections possible. But in 2023, they recovered both Gnaspis and Leptopelina at, at all release sites. Recoveries were higher in August and September collections than they were earlier in the season, and they had no recoveries at non-release sites. This was mostly from fruit collections as from sentinel traps. Uh, we, they were not getting as much data out of, not getting as many parasitoids. And this was found by a number of different researchers. So again, we see that there's an increase in parasitism later in the season. I also want to point out in this lower graph, the circled areas are where they were actually finding Gnaspis. So some one of the, the patterns we see throughout this is that Leptopelina in most of our collections was collected in far greater amounts than Gnaspis. Uh, same thing we saw in Michigan and, uh, and Cornell in New York. So looking at the USDA's work based in Delaware and their collaborations with colleagues in Maryland and Pennsylvania, they did a lot of work mass producing Gnaspis. So the USDA lab uh, had the parental colony that was distributed then to 17 different labs across the US. And they also produced Gnaspis that were released in Delaware, Maryland, and Pennsylvania. Uh, in 2023, Gnaspis was recovered before new releases were made, which meant that from their 2022 releases, Gnaspis probably did get established in these areas. What we found in these collections uh, was very promising. Uh, depending on the release and recovery area, in Delaware, parasitism ranged from zero to 79%, Maryland from zero to 73%, and Pennsylvania from zero to 50%. So these high levels of parasitism, 79 and 73, these are as high as levels of parasitism we found in our Asian collections. Also want to point out that they found paras parasite activity on a number of associated spotted wing Drosophila host plants. In fact, in Delaware, they really dive deeper into host plant um, levels of spotted wing as well as levels of parasitism. So we see in the top graph, densities of spotted wing varied among these different host plants, as did densities of parasitism. So in black cherry, for example, we had very little spotted wing, but higher percentage levels of parasitism. In the bottom graph, 
what we see here is a seasonal pattern, temporal pattern of parasitism and host density, similar to what we pointed out in both Michigan and Maine. So initially, spot only takes off early in the season before parasitism levels start and the parasitism levels go up towards the end of the season a little bit higher. New Jersey had five release sites in 2022, released about 5,000 Ganaspis, and increased to 10 release sites in 2023 and released about 10,000 Ganaspis. So the same level of Ganaspis uh, at each release site in both years. Uh, just showing 2023 data right here, uh, more flies than wasps were found. Uh, this is, is very, uh, uh, shown very graphically here with about four wasps collected at this one site and about three collected at this other site. So far more wasps than flies and more leptopelina were recovered than Ganaspis, a pattern we're seeing at all of these different release sites. And in fact, as we go down south, North Carolina, uh, in 2022, they recovered leptopelina at three sites and in 2023, they recovered leptopelina at all four sites. Uh, to date, no known recoveries of Ganaspis in North Carolina. A little further south, uh, nine locations with 18 sites in Georgia. In 2022, released about 10,000 Ganaspis. 2023, about 6,000 Ganaspis. What was exciting from this area was the recoveries of Ganaspis away from the release site. So they found Ganaspis about 1.6 miles from the nearest release site, suggesting that it's not just establishing at these release sites, but it's starting to have movement away from the release sites as well. Other work being done at Georgia is really important for looking at how these parasitoids are gonna work inside the different crop systems. Um, the work out of University of Georgia is looking at insecticide impacts, not just on spotted wing, but also on Ganaspis and Pachycarpoideus as well. So they're looking to see, especially with some of these organically registered materials, uh, whether or not there's a negative impact on these parasitoids. Will sprays work well in combination with insecticide, with uh, parasite releases? What they found was that Malathion in trust Mustang Max was most toxic among the insect insecticides tested. Grandivo was the least toxic to the parasitoids of the different materials tested. Uh, and even some of the organic materials such as Entrust and Delegate had sublethal effects on these different natural enemies. So at this point in time, Probably it's safe to say that most insecticides sprayed for spotted wing will also have some negative impact on our natural enemies, these, these uh, fidgeted wasps and the pupil parasitoids. In California, we released uh, at four uh, and eight sites in 2022 and 2023 with both fruit collection and sentinel traps. We recovered some low levels of Gnaspis but what's surprising to us is we still have not recovered any leptopelina. And we've even gone up to the Oregon border trying to see if we can't lepto find leptopelina in the state, but we have not found it yet. A side study we're doing in California is looking at cold storage of Ganaspis. And this is in cooperation with Xing King Wang and colleagues in Italy, Valero Rossi Tosconi and Antonio Biondi. Basically, we're looking at two temperatures, 10 and 15 degrees, and storage periods of two, four, six, or eight weeks for larval, pupil, and ferrate adults of Ganaspis. So what we found is that storing pupa at 10 to 15 degrees for two weeks does not compromise wasp fitness. And storing larvae can be done, but may impact wasp fitness. We think this is important because what we can now do is mass produce the parasitoids, store them for a short period of time, up to two weeks, before we're ready to go out to the field and release these throughout the different states, the, uh, throughout the different regions. 
In Oregon, they are releasing Gnaspis and recovering both Gnaspis and Leptopelina, but one of the studies uh, led by Von Walton that we found interesting was looking at the levels of parasitism and the species composition in areas before the parasitoid releases either began, began or before the advent of populations were showing up moving south or east from British Columbia. So in the top graph, we see a site here in 2013, and we look at levels of parasitism and everything they collected was pachycropoideus. 10 years later in 2023 at that same site, we can see a shift where now they're collecting in some of these collections, 100% leptopelina or at least a fidgeted, a leptopelina-like species. Uh, and we saw this same pattern at a number of different sites. We're just focusing here on a blueberry site, uh, blueberry crop and wild blackberries near Jefferson, Oregon. 2023, everything was pachycropoideus. And 2020, sorry, 2013. And in 2023, we get a shift with some of the fidgeted wasps showing up. For the Washington update, we're not going to quite look at the release of Gnaspis because they're so close to British Columbia, they've got uh, high levels of both Leptopelina and Gnaspis showing up. So what we're going to look at here is work funded uh, also by uh, an OREI grant uh, out of Betsy Beers' lab. They're looking at comparing different sampling methods to see what sampling methods might be best for collecting these fidgets. So they're looking at fruit samples using setno fruit, wine vinegar traps, a sentry lure, or a sentry lure with a yellow sticky car. What they found was the wine vinegar trap and the uh, sentry lure captured more leptopelina than Gnaspis, and that in part is because leptopelina is just more common than Gnaspis. And they were also better collection methods than both fruit sample or fruit sentinel samples as well. So just to kind of summary, summary of what's going on, we can see here across the US, the 2022 in green, 2023 releases of Gnaspis and the 2023 releases of Leptoplina japonica. Now Gnaspis, we've got the permits to release across the US, Leptoplina japonica, it's a state-by-state -state permit to release within the state once that fidgeted has been found. A summary of some of the things we've been finding. Um, first, looking at both Maryland and Oregon, percent parasitism levels on average have been very high, 41% and 34%. So this has got to be in part because of these fidgeted wasps, which are moving adventitiously or through our releases of Gnaspis. Next important thing is that to date, Leptopelina has been far more common than Gnaspis has been in most of our recoveries across most of our collection areas. Again, this is in part because Leptopelina has got a broader host range, so it's gonna be a better um, invasive species because it can attack a few other of these fly species. It probably will take a number of years to find out how the Gnaspis will balance out. But as Shen King will mention, we are also looking at importing some other strains of Gnaspis that might be a little bit more aggressive in certain areas. And the last slide I want to show is um, there are differences in parasitism amongst the different spotted wing Drosophila host plants. Leptoplina has been found in all of these different spotted wing host plants, but Gnaspis brasiliensis has been found in only half of these plants. And part of what might be going on is the size of the host plant and how far into the host fruit the spotted wing Drosophila larva can bore when it feeds. These fidgeted wasps have got a fairly small ovipositor or stinger of the bee. So it's the ovipositor is what the wasp uses to put an egg into the spotted wing maggot inside the fruit. So in some of these larger fruit sizes, 
if the maggot can bore further into the fruit, it might find a refuge getting out of reach from what these wasps can reach. So this is something else we're going to look at in the future. Uh, and with that, I'm going to uh, turn this over to uh, Caesar and behavioral controls. Thank you, Kent. Um, so I'll be covering uh, this sub objective 3.2, which is uh, behavioral control. And the goals of uh, this uh, sub objective is to develop novel behavior based strategies to manage Spotterwind Drosophila and also to evaluate existing uh, strategies. So uh, our ultimate goal is to, um, as for other strategies that we are developing, is to reduce the number of insecticide applications and thus to reduce uh, insecticide use. So this is our team. Um, so I'm I'm leading this uh, sub objective as I mentioned, uh, but there's uh, several members uh, that are participating in this sub objective uh, from different states. Um, so uh, we're testing different uh, tools uh, to manipulate the Spotterwind Drosophila behavior. Um, these tools. Uh, uh, have different approaches, uh, but uh, in general, they contain either an attractant to attract the flies to a source, a phagostimulant to motivate them to feed on the source, and an insecticide. So um, not all of them have all the components, but they have combinations of one or two of them. So in the past, um, this was led by uh, Von Walton from Oregon State. Uh, they developed this uh, food grade gum. Uh, this is a matrix that um, uh, promotes the oviposition um, by females. Um, so it, uh, they compete with the fruit that is in the field. So females um, are approach this uh, food grade gum uh, they are attracted to it and lay eggs on the food grade gum. Those eggs will not develop into flies. So, um, so it reduces the population of the spotter wing in the field. Um, we initiated um, uh, experiments looking at Actra SWD. Uh, this is a product uh, uh, made by ISCA Technologies. Uh, from uh, California. Um, we uh, initially, uh, it was called um, SPLAT, SWD. Uh, now they changed the name to ACTRA. Uh, it's uh, a matrix that releases slowly um, semiochemicals. Uh, so you can also uh, mix them with, uh, with an insecticide. Uh, so it acts as an attract and kill. So it's, uh, it has a, 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 a volatiles that are attractive to the spotter wing. And, um, and when they contact or feed on the substrate, uh, they, they, uh, they take up the, the insecticide. So the one uh, that I'm going to be discussing today is one that we have been testing in the past uh, couple of years at least, and is Combi Protect. Uh, this it combines, uh, has an, uh, it's a phagostimulant that you can combine with your insecticide and apply it as a cover spray or as a bait spray. So that's the one that uh, we have been looking at in the past two years. So that's what I'm going to uh, discuss today and uh, most, uh, most of tomorrow, unless everyone, somebody has a question uh, on the other ones. Um, so Combi Protect, um, the company uh, sells it as an insect bait. Um, they are interested in, in reducing the volume, the amount of, uh, the volume of insecticide that you apply in your field. Uh, it's a feeding stimulant. So you mix it with your insecticide and uh, increases the chances that an insect will feed on the substrate. 
Um, also, you can um, use it as an adjuvant. Uh, I mentioned that um, we have tested it as a cover spray. So you can just mix it with your insecticide and apply it um, uh, as a conventional, as any uh, insecticide application uh, in your tank. So this is data that um, that Arun and, and Ash have collected from Georgia. This is just a behavioral uh, choice test looking at how uh, Spotterwind Drosophila adults respond to Combiprotec. Um, and uh, you can see like when there's a choice between Combiprotec at the top and the blueberries, they go for the blueberries. Uh, when there's a choice between uh, the blueberries with the combi protect versus the blueberries and water, and they don't have a choice. Um, when there's a choice uh, with just the combi protect, they don't make a choice either. Uh, they go with the blueberries when the other choice is water, and with the water control, there's no choice. So, um, so what we are seeing here is that combi protect does not elicit an attraction or repellency in adult spotted drosophila, which is what the company um, told us. Uh, there's no attraction, attractive uh, compounds that are, um, or volatiles that are included in the, the formulation. Uh, so we looked also at two choice tests when the combi protect is added to different insecticides and you can see there's uh, a list of different insecticides, uh, pyrethroids, uh, some of the, spino the spinosad, uh, diamides, uh, XRL. Uh, uh, we have a Sera, a Sale, a Delegate. Uh, with the Combi Protect or without the Combi Protect, and uh, there was no no difference. So there was no. Uh, uh, they did not make a, a, a choice between one or the other. So the combi protect, as I, as I mentioned, uh, it doesn't seem to be attracting the flies uh, uh, to um, and affecting the, um, uh, and it, this is not being influenced by the insecticide that, that, uh, that is used. So um, in, 2022, we conducted a semi-field experiment. Uh, this was, uh, I'm showing you the, the work that we did in New Jersey, but this was done across uh, many different states. Um, here we looked at um, uh, an untreated control, uh, an insecticide program at a half rate, and an insecticide program at the half rate plus the combi protect, uh, the full, insecticide program, the full rate of the insecticide program, and also the insecticide program at the full rate with the combi protect. So the program consisted of rotations of uh, four insecticides, uh, imidan, mastang max, malathion, and delegate. Uh, these studies were done um, at uh, research centers where bushes were treated with these different insecticides, Fruit and foliage was collected from the bushes, brought to the lab, placed in containers like what you see on the left, top left. And then um, uh, flies were released inside the containers. Uh, we looked at mortality, uh, uh, egg counts on uh, in the fruits, and also we incubated the fruit as you see on the bottom left. Uh, for adult emergence to look at the next generation. Um, so these are the results that we got from um, from New Jersey. Uh, this is work done by my postdoc, uh, Beth Ferguson. So this is week one when we used uh, Imiden. And just to point out, um, to highlight uh, two significant uh, results, uh, so you see like the, the different treatments, the control, the combi protect alone, the half rate alone, the half rate with the combi protect, the full rate and the full rate plus the combi protect. And uh, one uh, result to highlight is when you mix the half rate with the combi protect, you get 
higher mortality. And this was done at day zero and day four. So when we mix uh, max and max, we see the same, similar trend. You can see with the half rate with the combi protect, at least in uh, day zero, we see a trend for higher mortality, but it was not significant. Also, we, dis we see the same trend at day four. With malathion, we did not see any, any difference uh, with the half or the full rate. And with delegate, um, we saw um, a significance uh, by day four. So, um, so the half rate with the combi protect uh, has a higher uh, mortality rates than the full the half rate alone. So this is with oviposition. If you're killing the flies, um, you we see a reduction in oviposition. So um, you can see here uh, there was a lower number of eggs in fruits. Uh, with the combi protect at both uh, half and full rates uh, for the imidan. Also, we saw that uh, same pattern uh, in day four. For Mustang Max, um, we see the same pattern, but uh, it was not significant. Um, Malathion was not significant either. However, uh, with the delegate, we see this same trend of uh, lower uh, egg lane uh, when you have the half rate with a combi protect compared to the half rate alone. And that was seen uh, also at the full rate um, on day four. So this is a uh, similar data from Georgia. And you can see, um, you know, the treatments uh, were uh, water alone, um, the combi protect, the delegate, delegate uh, plus the combi protect, a cell, a cell with combi protect, XRL, XRL with combi protect, malathion alone, and with a combi protect, Mustang Max alone, with a combi protect, and then trust uh, alone and with a combi protect. And you can see that you see a reduction in um, number of progeny that emerged uh, when you have. Uh, the insecticide plus the combi protect compared to the insecticide alone. So we um, also, um, this is data from uh, last year. Uh, we conducted um, a study in commercial fields. Um, that was the first time that we were allowed to do a field trial uh, because the product um, is a still in the process, is now registered, and I'll, I'll discuss that tomorrow. Uh, but uh, they are, the company is still looking for, uh, is still in the process of getting labels uh, for different states. So we were allowed to do studies under field conditions, but in limited amount of acreages. So we did um, a study here in New Jersey where we uh, convinced a grower to allow us to use uh, the full rate, so he just uh, did uh, a rotation of imidan, Mustang Max, uh, Malathion, Espinetoram, uh, Delegate, and imidan. Um, the, we did a half rate, uh, a full rate with the Combi Protect, and a half rate with the Combi Protect. Um, because of the risk, we did not have the full rate alone. Um, uh, this is a commercial farm, so we did not want to take the risk. So we did this um, weekly, uh, weekly rotations for five weeks, and uh, we uh, collected a fruit um, during those weeks to look at infestation. So in addition, we also collected foliage that was treated uh, and also fruit that was treated. We brought it to the lab and did uh, those bioassays that I show you um, before to look at adult mortality. Also, we looked at infestation of the berries. So we collected the berries after exposure for three days um, and um, incubated them and then uh, looked at 
uh, the emergence. Uh, actually, in this case, we did uh, a salt extraction to just um, uh, detect for larvae uh, in the fruit. So this is data on the mortality. Um, the first weeks, we did not see um, any um, any effects. Um, while the grower was uh, conducting the regular sprays, uh, we did not see any any differences uh, across treatments. However, um, at the um, um, at the end of the season, uh, we um, this did not show the for some reason doesn't show the uh, the treatment. So the twelve is the full rate. Um, the um, the eleven is the full rate plus the combi protect, and I believe the the ten is the uh, half rate uh, with the combi protect. Uh, so we did see a, a decrease in um, in mortality um, at the half rate uh, plus the combi protect compared to the uh, the full rate with and without the combi protect, uh, but. This did not translate into any differences in a larval infestation. So this is uh, data from um, from Georgia, similar data, um, uh, also like they did rotations uh, and in in the field, uh, looking at the full rate, the full rate uh, plus combi protect and the half rate plus combi protect, and they also did not see any any differences across the treatments. So this is uh, the data that um, Vaughn was mentioning. Um, and this is uh, uh, data that they collected in Oregon. Uh, this was done, uh, again, it's a uh, field trial in five acres. Um, and they had uh, three treatments, the Combi Protect. Uh, in this case, they use it as a bait. So they reduce the volume that was applied, um, the combi protect at 50% and, um, and the grower standard. And um, you can see that um, one uh, interesting uh, thing that they found is that the combi protect as applied as a bait uh, was fairly effective. Uh, you can see even like better in some cases than the grower standard. So, um, so that's what the company claims that um, that you can spray at lower volumes and still have uh, good efficacy against the spotted wing. Uh, we need to do more testing uh, to um, to show that that's the case, especially under field conditions. But uh, this is this shows promise that even uh, if we reduce the, the the volume of the application, we can still have um, uh, good efficacy with the combi protect so um so what we are finding um so far like after you know four well in my case for many more years but uh through this um uh, this grant uh, has been that uh behavioral stat uh, behavior based strategies like combi protect uh, are showing promise um in reducing the spotted wind drosophila infestation and hopefully they can be used to reduce insecticide use um, however, we are finding that the efficacy of these strategies can be influenced by uh, different factors, like um, how um, males and females respond to these uh, strategies can vary. Also, uh, they can vary based on the physiological state of the um, of the insect, uh, whether the age, for example, of the insect. Um, whether they uh, they are starved or not, uh, whether they are mated or not. Also, they are dependent on uh, the population density. Uh, they tend to break down if uh, you have a high uh, density of a spotted wing in your field. Uh, so they tend to work better at lower densities. Uh, also, they are going to be competing with the fruit. Um, so a lot of them are based on competition with the fruit that is uh, present in the field. So if you have a uh, high density of fruits uh, on the bushes, uh, the, um, 
the efficacy of, of uh, these strategies is lower. So um, uh, this is mainly uh, work that uh, uh, has been done in Cornell uh, under uh, Greg Loeb's lab, uh, looking at uh, repellents for Spada wing drosophila. Uh, his lab has tested um, three uh, repellents, uh, one uh, octanol, uh, jasmine, and more recently, uh, two pentyl furan. Um, the the jasmine, the, the efficacy in the field has not been that good. Um, and also uh, one uh, octanol um, can have some uh, human toxicity and also has a strong smell. For that reason, this lab is, has been in the past uh, few years have been uh, looking mainly at two pentyl furan as a potential repellent for Spotted Winter Sophila. So they, um, last year they conducted um, um, PILA studies looking at uh, two pentyl furan alone, uh, two pentyl furan with an insecticide, an insecticide alone, and a control as treatments. Uh, they release, uh, one of the challenges that we have with repellents is the formulation, how do we apply them under field conditions? So uh, so Greg's lab has been testing different ways to apply them. Um, they looked at sachets, buffers, and now they used at these the spirals, as you can see in the in the picture on the right side. So they tested this uh, two pentylfuran, uh, pentylfuran in these uh, spirals. Uh, they collected fruit from these fields, and uh, they um, they rear. Um, uh, they looked at uh, the number of larvae, uh, pupae, uh, and also they counted the number of wasps that emerged. And they also, in addition, they monitor for natural enemies and pollinators in these fields. Um, so we don't want to disrupt by using these repellents or even like using these, the attractants or attract and kill, we don't want to disrupt the natural enemies or uh, the pollinators. So um, so these are the data that they, they have for the number of immatures per berry for the uh, four different treatments. So to furan alone with an insecticide, uh, insecticide alone and the control. And uh, what you can see is that um, the two pentyl furan actually reduce uh, a spot of wind drosophila infestation compared to the other, other treatments. So this uh, looks promising. Um, uh, also, they looked at parasitism, and uh, the parasitism actually was higher under, um, under two uh, uh, pentyl furan in the two uh, pentyl furan plots. And uh, this is just looking at uh, the different groups of uh, the different uh, natural enemy taxa. And tupentilfuran did not significantly impact the overall natural enemy and pollinator activity. Uh, so, um, so you can see um, the only differences that I, uh, they observed was like, a, you can see a reduction in yellow jackets. Um, uh, with the uh, two pentyl furan. So the uh, the goal um, for us is like to combine. Uh, uh, we're realizing that uh, these strategies are not very effective as a standalone. So uh, our goal in 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 now and in the future is to combine them to see whether if you com if you look at combination of these strategies you get. Uh, better um, control of a spotter wing. So one of these uh, methods is to use uh, these push-pull systems where you combine attractants with repellents. So you have, um, you uh, push them with a, a repellent and then you're pulling them with an attractant to an area where you can kill them. Um, 
So, um, so the use of the uh, two pentyl furan uh, as a push, so to push them out of the, the field, and uh, the sentry lures as a pull to lure them outside uh, the, uh, the, the, the field into a, a trap that had a drowning solution. So, uh, and the control was, uh, had no push-pull. So you, you compared like those two treatments, the push-pull and no push-pull. And um, they found, they looked at um, the Sparta uh infestation. Uh, one thing to note, as you can see, is that the pressure was fairly low, uh, but there was no significant differences between the treatments. So as I, I as I mentioned, uh, the take home of these studies is that uh, in integrating multiple behavior based strategies uh, such as uh, combining uh, repellents with attractants might be uh, better than than just using a single strategy. And um, right now, and uh, I'm going to discuss this in more detail tomorrow. Um, Actra and and both Actra and Comi Protect are going through the registration process in the US. So there's um, there's several uh, publications that uh, came up, came out from this work. Um, so these are some examples of some of these uh, publications um, from some of the, the, the work that I, um, not the work that I described because this is new, but some of the previous work that has led to this, this work. And uh, this has been uh, work that has been sponsored. Uh, some of the work has been sponsored by IR4. Uh, we are partnering with IR4 uh, um, with, um, and also Andermatt, who's the, the company that uh, makes uh, Combi Protect, uh, to work together towards um, the registration of uh, this product. Uh, right now it's available in 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 Europe, but as I mentioned, um, is in the process. Hopefully, um, of registration. Hopefully, um, it will be available soon in different states here in the U.S. Uh, we have been also working with um, Isca Technologies, um, with Actra, and the registration of their product. Um, uh, we had several conversations in the past couple of years with EPA. Um, it's a little bit, bit more complicated uh, because uh, Actra has uh, semiochemicals or volatiles included in the formulation, and um, and those volatiles are considered biopesticides. So um, so they require tolerances. So. Uh, so we have been working with the company and EPA to, to help the process of registration of these uh, new new products. So, um, so that's all I have. I don't know if there's any questions. Thanks, Cesar, for the detailed update. Uh, let's move right along to the next uh, objective four. If you have any questions, please uh, type them in the chat or in Q and A uh, windows, and we'll uh, get uh, get those answered for you. So uh, let's move on to objective four, which is uh, uh, Joanne and Cho and uh, uh, Rufus Isaac's uh, programs, and uh, uh, also Christine from uh, Joanne and Cho's lab may be presenting that. So. and thank you, Ash, for the introduction. So the for objective four, we'd like to assess and reduce the risk of insecticide resistance development. Um, so I'll be going over our progress, um, a little bit over what we've done in the past few years, and then more um, impact on what we, or more emphasis on what we've done in the past year um, with our collaborators. So in terms of monitoring the development and the extent of insecticide resistance um, in the past couple years, so since 2021 up until now in 2024, 
Uh, we have seen that the insecticide susceptibility of SWD has been measured in multiple states. Um, thus far, at least up until 2023, we've only detected resistance in California populations um, have, and have not detected resistance in other states. Um, we have seen that the resistance in California uh, has been able to be sustained throughout the years with resistance ratios generally increasing over the years. So the resistance ratio is basically the concentration of insecticide required to kill half of the tested population in the resistant population divided by that same um, concentration required to kill half of the population in the susceptible population. So um, this particular graph here was adapted from our work that was published in 2022. And you can see that from 2018 to 2020, um, the resistance ratio has actually progressively increased or has a general trend towards increasing in four different populations that were tested. So two populations were from, from conventional orchards and then two were from organic um, cultures. So because we have continued to detect insecticide resistance, we actually wanted to know what the molecular mechanisms were that were actually um, responsible for uh, the resistance that we see. So that way we can improve um, our control methods. So in a susceptible population, um, the insecticide here is denoted by these little skull icons. It can actually penetrate through the insect cuticle um, once it's inside the insect cuticle, there are metabolic enzymes that can actually break down the insecticide prior to it actually binding to its target protein. Um, however, not all of the insecticide is broken down, so it'll actually bind to its target, resulting in the death of the insect. In the case of a resistant um, insect, there are multiple mechanisms um, that can actually result in this resistance. The first one is called penetration resistance. So the insect can actually have a thicker cuticle or exoskeleton that will actually reduce the amount of insecticide that can actually penetrate through the cuticle. We also know that there um, could be metabolic resistance. So you can have an increase in the number of metabolic enzymes that are being expressed in these particular insects resulting in complete breakdown of the um, insecticide prior to it actually binding to its target protein. And then the final um, mechanism is the target site resistance. In this particular case, the target site on the protein um, is actually mutated such that the insecticide can no longer bind to it, um, allowing the insect to survive. So in many other insect species, you can either have one or a combination of all of these different mechanisms. So the reason we wanna understand the mechanisms for the insecticide resistance is because it enables for us to monitor the resistance and identify it in places where it has yet to be identified. Um, as I mentioned earlier, thus far we've only seen it in California. Um, as well as helping us to actually manage Suzuki eye um, infestations. So for instance, if we see penetration resistance or metabolic resistance or target site, we can actually develop a molecular diagnostic so we can detect the resistance early. Um, that way we can combat the effects early on. And I have a, um, some work on this that I would like to show in a little bit. If we see penetration resistance, we can actually use bait traps um, such as the ones that Cesar mentioned earlier. So that way, um, rather than the insecticide needing to penetrate through the insect cuticle, you can actually have the insects consume it, making it more effective. Um, if you see metabolic resistance, we can apply a chemical synergist. So synergists are metabolic enzyme inhibitors. So if you can inhibit the metabolic enzymes, um, you can then actually um, prevent the further breakdown of the insecticide. And then finally, if we see target site resistance, we can actually try to um, adjust the management program to relieve some of the um, stress that's put on the insects so that way they're not adapting quickly. Um, and we can probably get rid of that 
uh, target site resistance over a few generations. So in order to identify these resistance mechanisms, what we did is we produced um, isogenic lines or lines from a single resistant female. Um, and then we screened these progeny of these females for a susceptible and a resistant sister line. So because these lines all generated from the same female, um, all of their genetic background is similar. So then we can attribute any differences we see um, to the fact that they're resistant and not just normal basic um, genetic differences between the two. So it's easier to compare siblings as opposed to trying to compare uh, cousins, for instance. So once we've identified these susceptible and resistant lines, um, we have looked at lines for spinosad resistance, pyrethroid resistance, as well as organophosphates. Um, but that's for today, I'm only going to be describing our results for spinosad as well as pyrethroid. Okay, so once we have our uh, susceptible and resistant lines, we extracted RNA from these flies. Um, and then we prepared them for next generation sequencing. We sequenced the complete transcriptome of both of the lines, and then we performed bioinformatic analyses in order to identify the different resistance mechanisms that I described earlier. So how exactly did we identify these resistant and susceptible lines? So we performed the rapid test bioassays um, on these isofemale lines to find lines that were particularly resistant to spinosad. So you coat the inside of a glass bottle with one mil of the insecticide and you fully rotate it so the insecticide goes throughout the entire vial. You allow the insecticide to dry and then you place the um, SWD into the vials and then you wait eight hours and then you assess for mortality as well as um, morbidity. So using this rapid test, um, I looked at the percent mortality in several different lines. So each of these C1 through C8 lines are different um, isogenic female lines. And the reason we call them C is because they were isolated from cane berries. And then the W1 and W2 lines are our susceptible control. So we know that these lines are going to be susceptible to insecticides. So you could see both controls have 100% mortality during the bioassays. Um, and then lines three and four have the least amount of mortality showing that they are resistant. And then we also pick two susceptible sister controls, lines C7 and C8. Um, to sequence side by side with our resistant line. Okay. So our RNA-seq data provided evidence of both metabolic and penetration resistance in um, our two lines that we tested. So on the y-axis here, I have the relative expression of each of the various genes. And then on the x-axis, I have the different genes that I tested. So in penetration resistance, oftentimes what you see is an increase in the amount of proteins expressed in the cuticle. So cuticular proteins as well as cuticle genes. Um, and we can see that in line C3, which is this magenta color, we have a high expression of those genes, whereas our susceptible control in black as well as our um, other resistant line in blue doesn't show a high expression of these genes. And then interestingly, when we look at um, genes involved in metabolic resistance, including cytochrome P450 genes, heat shock proteins, or GSTs, or glutathione S transferases, we see a high expression of those metabolic genes in one of the resistant lines, line C4, um, and then similar expression in line C3 to the susceptible line. So what we see is one line is exhibiting penetration resistance while the other line is exhibiting metabolic resistance. Okay, so when we look at all of the genes that are actually highly, highly expressed in these two different lines, we see an enrichment for cuticle development genes in line C3, um, which is denoted down here. And then in 
our line C4, we actually see an enrichment for genes that are involved in the metabolic pathways. So that's all the genes down here, um, metabolic pathways is there. So this further shows um, what I showed in the previous slide. So it's interesting that um, you can have a population that's actually resistant to the same insecticide. However, there's two different mechanisms that are driving that resistance. So we then saw, um, we then wanted to look at more recent populations of um, Suzuki eye. So the ones that I've been showing you are from 2019. So we then looked at a 2022 population um, and we wanted to see whether we actually did see increased cytochrome P450 or SIP gene expression in these populations. So we were looking at two different populations that I denote here as population one and population two. Um, we exposed them to both azetacybermethrin or a pyrethroid as well as spinosad. And we do see that they have um, significantly less mortality as compared to our susceptible control denoted by this dotted red line here. So using these lines, uh, we looked at the expression of different cytochrome P450 genes. So the types of genes are listed here, 6A8, 40, 14, as well as 6W1. And then I also looked at two penetration resistant associated genes, Tweedle F and Tweedle G. And what we see is that in these newer populations, so line one and line two, we actually have a significant increase in the amount of expression of the cytochrome P450 genes as compared to our 2019 resistant populations and our susceptible populations. So not only are we still being able to see the resistance, but it's actually progressively getting higher. Um, and that is evident in all three of the genes that we tested. Um, and it's as high as 17.3 fold higher than the 2019 population. Um, and then when we look at the expression of our penetration resistance associated genes, Tweedle F, there's basically no expression. It's very close to susceptible lines here. Um, so we don't see any uh, penetration resistance, but we do see metabolic resistance in these lines. And these populations also show that we have um, evidence of enhanced metabolic resistance that has been occurring over the years probably due to increased spring. So with the genes that we were able to identify and use these biomarkers, we wanted to see whether this could actually work as a um, molecular diagnostic. Could we actually test these five genes and still continue to see resistance and use it as a means of identifying resistance in different populations? So using a 2023 collected uh, population, I tested the same genes, it's in the same order. So the top three genes are associated with metabolic resistance, while the bottom two are associated with penetration resistance. And what we can see is this new population, line three, actually has um, higher expression of these metabolic genes as compared to our resistant and susceptible control, showing that until now, the resistance is still stable and it's still increasing. And that we can actually use this um, particular diagnostic to identify um, resistance with field populations. And then in terms of penetration resistance, we don't see any evidence of that in this new 2023 collected population. So earlier I mentioned that if we were able to, de to detect uh, metabolic resistance, we can actually use a synergist in combination with the insecticide to actually increase the efficacy of the insecticide. So one of the things that our collaborators did in Dr. Frank Salem's lab is they used different ratios of insecticide concentration, pyganic, to um, the synergist PBO. Um, and the ratios are indicated here. So the red line is a one-to-one -one ratio, the dotted line is one-to-two, and then um, the blue line is basically if you don't have any of the synergists at all, and it's the insecticide alone. And at various concentrations of pyganic, you can see that if you just have pyganic alone, you don't have any mortality. 
Um, but if you do use it in combination with a synergist, whether it's two fold higher or just one fold the same amount, um, you do get an increase in mortality. So we can actually use this particular um, synergist to kind of help combat the effects of the metabolic resistance that we're seeing in our population. The next thing that we did is we wanted to test our molecular assay and look at it side by side with resistant stability and see whether we can see kind of slight variations and decreases in the amount of gene expression that we see. So I looked at two different genes and we mixed different ratios of susceptible Suzuki and resistant Suzuki populations. So in one mix, we have less um, resistant flies mixed with like, a higher population of susceptible lines. And then we put equal numbers of resistant to susceptible lines. And then finally, we had a, um, a case in which there were more resistant flies and then there were less susceptible flies. So in all cases, you actually have, regardless of if you have this um, simulation of invasion of a susceptible population to a resistant population, you actually get a, a significant decrease in the amount of gene expression as compared to a, a resistant line alone. So when you have this simulated invasion, um, you can actually reduce the amount of resistance that we are seeing. And I see a similar trend with the second gene that I looked at, my apologies, um, with the second gene that I looked at. Um, so these are both metabolic resistant associated genes. So our molecular um, diagnostic also shows that we can detect uh, gradients of the amount of resistance that we see. So it's not like a black or white kind of thing. We can kind of see the resistance building up or getting um, lessened over time, which is quite informative. Okay. So one of the big reasons that we wanted to develop this molecular diagnostic is there are several advantages to using it. Um, first of all, it requires a lot fewer flies than doing the rapid bioassay that I showed earlier. Um, you can actually perform a lot of these assays with just a single fly. You can have the results in less than a day. Um, so all of it from extracting the RNA, all the a way to produce our graphs can be done in one day's time. Um, you can also detect low levels of resistance at the population level as shown by our um, simulated uh, migration and invasion data in the previous slide. And this will inform us whether or not the resistance is actually starting to build up and creep up in other places. And it will promote early action to combat this resistance. So if we start to see these gene expression levels getting higher, we can notify people to um, start doing dose response assays and checking whether or not that resistance ratio is actually getting higher um, in their population so they can take action sooner. So in order to illustrate the value of this tool, uh, we wanted to use our molecular diagnostic on four colonies that Ash's lab had sent to us um, from Georgia which their resistance status is unknown. So these flies were not tested in rapid bioassays. And so I tested these um, four populations labeled as line one to line four uh, for both metabolic resistance as well as penetration resistance. Uh, in I have my susceptible control here. And then in the second one, I have the resistant line. And you can see that there are relatively low levels of all the me uh, metabolic genes that we tested in these lines. So there's no evidence of metabolic resistance. However, what we do see is increased levels of the penetration resistant associated genes. So Tweedle G and Tweedle F are significantly higher um, in line one as compared to our susceptible controls, suggesting that resistance might be building up in this particular population. So because we saw this increased level of expression of genes, we actually asked um, Ash's lab to do the bioassays on these and they did see um, that the flies are resistant to entrust, so espinosid, 
but they're not resistant to malathion. So they're, the specificity of penetration resistance being associated with spinosad resistance, which we saw in our California populations, is consistent in these Georgia lines. Um, yeah, so the bioassays were performed um, and they do match what we previously saw. They're resistant to entrust and not to malathion. So we are now starting to see a buildup of resistance in states outside of California. So um, I'll talk more about this tomorrow, but our goal is to kind of start looking at populations from different states using this molecular assay so we can inform people to start um, doing the uh, bioassays as well. Okay. So in summary, we detected evidence of three different mechanisms of insecticide resistance um, in both populations of lines that are resistant to spinosad. Uh, I'm sorry. So we see penetration resistance in one line um, that's resistant to spinosad and not um, in the other line. In one line, we see evidence of metabolic resistance. And then I didn't show the data here, but I saw no evidence of target resistance in either line. And then really briefly, in lines that are resistant to pyrethroid, we again, we tested two different lines. Um, both lines do not show any evidence of penetration resistance, but they do show evidence of metabolic resistance. And then in the case of these lines, um, Rather than having a mutated part of the tar on the target protein, they actually are expressing less of that target protein. So if they have less target protein available, then there's less for the insecticide to bind to, so the effects are a lot lower. So that's what we see for our pyrethroid lines. Um, and this work is currently in review, um, so hopefully it is published soon. And then uh, finally, we've developed a molecular assay in order to diagnose the metabolic and penetration resistance, and it seems to be working fairly well. Um, and with that, I just want to thank everyone who um, was working with us. Of course, my PI, Dr. Joanna Chu, as well as our collaborators, Frank Salem and Ash, Rufus, Stephen, um, and then everyone in Frank Salem's lab who helped out. And I will take any questions if there are any. Thanks, Christine, for excellent update on this objective. At this point, we can ask any questions. You can uh, type in the chat or in Q&A, and uh, we will uh, respond to those questions. So I do see a question here from Jibbing. Um, so it says, uh, exciting work. Do you expect the PBO to be synergist for pyrethrins only or also with the um, IRAC groups, thank you. So um, it is possible that it is a synergist for other groups as well. We actually do plan to test the synergist PBO in combat with other insecticides, um, as well as try to identify exactly which enzyme it's targeting. Um, that way we know which insecticide it would be most effective in conjunction with. So those experiments are underway right now. All right. Thanks, Christine. Uh, we, we can answer uh, questions uh, as we get in the chat. Let's move on to objective five. Um, you know, objective five is to deal with extension and outreach and uh, uh, evaluation of the impact of what we do here. I'll give you a very quick update on extension and outreach, and then we'll move it uh, on to K uh, Kelsey's team to do a, to give an update on evaluation work that has been going on. Uh, on this project. So uh, as I indicated earlier, all team members are involved in this objective uh, because we most of us have research and extension appointments. We all have stakeholders in our states. Uh, we do present to stakeholder meetings, research meetings, extension meetings, as well as regional meetings that more majority of the stakeholders attend. So in, uh, based on our previous knowledge, we uh, developed season-long SWD management programs and delivered those to stakeholders as, as appropriate. Uh, at least we had 36 specific research and extension presentations, 18 uh, research and extension publications, 48 blog posts, and numerous web articles, field days, and one-on-one -on -one meetings with growers that uh, we, you know, through which we did extend 
whatever we learned on this project. We also, our economics team is working on developing uh, economics decision aid tools that are being evaluated and will be shared with growers as soon as possible. We also, uh, every year we do one webinar and uh, uh, during the last year we did uh, our annual webinar on advances in biological control for management of spotted wing Drosophila, which was delivered on December uh, 4th. Uh, and uh, it was, uh, uh, there were 300 uh, attendees registered to listen to the webinar. And since then it was posted online and has been viewed by several hundred people online uh, as well. So with this, I will uh, move it on to our evaluation team. Kay and uh, Dami, over to you. So good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much for joining in. Today, we're gonna to talk a little bit about our evaluation work that we've been conducting over the last year. And Dami's gonna share some results from a national survey that we've been conducting. And then we'd like to have a short discussion with some of the stakeholders in attendance about uh, your extension participation and how we can encourage greater participation amongst your peers and colleagues. And so do we have the slides um, up for our particular section? Or can we advance the slide? Just click on the screen. Yeah. Oh, okay. There it is. Okay, great. Okay. Um, so what we've been doing for the past four years has been collecting information about the progress of the project. And it's a little bit of a self-examination process where we try to identify strengths and weaknesses of the project as it's been executed. And this last year of the project, we're in our final year, we call it a summative evaluation report. And what we've been doing is collecting information directly from growers who have attended project meetings. And so I'm gonna turn this over to Dami now to discuss what he has found in this survey. Okay, thank you, Dr. Kelsey. Thank you, Dr. Harsh, for the opportunity. First, I would like to appreciate all our um, stakeholders, all our task force members that have given us the opportunity and to interact with them and that has uh, uh, participated in our service over the national survey that we've been having so far. So um, what are we doing this time around? We're doing a submissive evaluation, which has to do with an evaluation that comes at the end of the survey, at uh, the end of a program since we know that the projects are gradually coming to an end. And um, the high is to highlight the accomplishments of the program so far, vis-a-vis uh, -vis the promised um, objectives and deliverables, and um, to offer evidence you know, to justify maybe further for the, um, funding of such um, um, program or project, or to justify the investment of taxpayers' money. And this actually provides insights to the short-term um, uh, outcomes, the medium-term outcome, and uh, the long-term outcome, which is also the impact evaluation. So what we have been doing for the past, uh, since last year, now we've been collecting data on um, different aspects of our program. And uh, this is to provide enough um, evidence for, this to provide enough evidence for a robust recommendation towards improving the project and even for subsequent uh, projects that might emanate from this um, uh, research activity. Can we move to the next slide, please? Okay, so, so what we did in uh, 2023 was to all our evaluation activities involved uh, uh, get following up on all the correspondence, you know, emanating the emails emanating between researchers among researchers within this unit. We conducted an impact evaluation across the United States, and uh, this forms the nucleus. It was the major, um, uh, the bulk, key, uh, the bulk part of our evaluation work for the last year, which is still ongoing as well. It actually spilled over to this year. We had. We had observations meeting all through during last year's meeting. We were there, we were present at all the meetings, getting our observational data, which are for our qualitative data. And we also had tracked all documentation that other important 
Arts Club that actually emanated from this uh, project so far. We also conducted a um, consumer satisfaction survey, which was um, administered during the um, webinar. And uh, we had useful information from that. And we also documented all the protocols emanating from all the researchers on this time. So um, findings from the National Impact Survey. So first of all, we've, um, we've tried as much as possible to use a mixed board method to collect data. And that was actually um, based on the fact that we want the data that we're having to be geographically dispersed, to be representative of the, of the nation as a whole, and to you know, include as many growers as possible. So we, we did an online, we used the mixed mode method, which com, uh, by comprise an online administration of a um, survey. We had the, Q, um, the, the QR code and also the link sent out to 30 different growers um, association in the United States. We combined that as well with um, being physically present at uh, different growers meeting across the nation. So going by the preliminary data that we got last year, that's what we used for this data analysis. And uh, the result that we are sh I'm sharing right now is based on the data that we got from the online um, 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 output from uh, all our stakeholders at the national level. So we have other data sets coming in from physical, um, from all the meetings that we attended physically. And those data is, are going to be incorporated later on to have a robust data set for in-depth analysis, even beyond the descriptive analysis. So going by the um, distribution of the growers from the states across the United States, we had 14 states um, that were actually um, involved in this um, survey. We had respondents from 14 states. And one thing that is striking and interesting is the fact that we had people coming in, even filling this survey, from Ontario, as well as uh, Colombia. Um, uh, British, so we have people living in this country from North America, so this will might actually be people that actually share boundary with the United States, and uh, where they have been disturbed as well without also um, spotted with also be there. But by and large, we have have the largest response uh, responses coming in from New Jersey, um, and that's followed by Michigan, but also um, California and Florida. While going by the distribution regionally, we have the highest coming from the northeastern part of the United States, which is followed by Midwest and also 70% from West, from the western part of the United States, of the West Coast. So looking at the crops cultivated by the growers, uh, we discovered that uh, blueberry and uh, strawberry were mostly represented among all those crops that were affected by uh, SWD, oh, sorry, among the crops that were cultivated by the growers. Um, that's 37% um, each. Um, that is followed by raspberry and blackberry. And looking at the egg trees that were cultivated, we discovered that most of these growers are small scale growers. So they cultivated between less than 10 acres of land. And that's what we have there. Very few of them actually cultivated uh, blueberry on about um, up to 600, uh, 600 acres of land. So we, we based on this data set, we, we, one can deduce that we have uh, most of our respondents being uh, small scale farmers. So looking at the, the, ex the experiences with SWD since the inception of this research group in um, 2008, looking at how far this research has actually helped them in managing SWD, we asked them about their experiences around 2008 and afterwards, it's one percent of the growers actually reported that they had incidents of SWD, while 11 percent still say that they're not sure. So even with the incidents of SWD in the United States um, um, overing across every state, we still have some people that are still in doubt that SWD is real. So um, looking at the year by year um, um, uh, appearance of SWD on their farm, the majority of them actually had that based on they are carrying their blueberry farms and, that, and followed by strawberry farms. And I think this is really, really close to what we have in our earlier presentation. Others that had a significant detection of SWD in recent years, that's between 2018 and 2023. It's, uh, we have that in, in raspberry, which is 15%. We have that in blackberry, which is 7%, and also in sweet sherry. So only two people actually re uh, responded that they had a kind of um, SWD infestation in their um, tax sherry production between 2018 and 2023. And that's the uh, in between the inception of this CCRI project. 
from the section of this ASC and our progress. Looking at the um, experience of the growers around 20, 2008, uh, we discovered that um, most of the growers actually had issues. They knew they had issues with accessibility on their farm and they knew that they, diff they experienced different level of losses associated with SWD. They had incidences of, uh, of, of uh, their neighbors having um, incidents of SWD. They saw maggots in their fruit. They had lost a significant proportion of their of their farmland, of their crops, to SWD, and they struggled to control SWD. But looking at the percentage crop loss due to SWD, we have that on the right-hand side of the slide, and uh, that's actually um, really, really significant when it comes to blueberry production. And um, strawberry, you have some like that, sweet cherry as well. So we have a high level of, um, of um, losses, you know, due to SWD in those um, three prominent um, um, crops. They're talking about the types of uh, practices that they used. One thing that was really, um, uh, that was prominent is the fact that um, they were actually using selective um, uh, 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 broad spectrum pesticides, selective pesticides were applied to pick and um, they did a uh, pick and um, uh, picking infested fruits and destroying them, early harvesting, all these different um, activities, which are more of the activities, one event activities um, introduced to growers at the onset of the detection of SWD on in um, in the United States by these researchers, they actually um, prescribed these cultural cultural, biological, uh, and um, chemical um, 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 control methods with, with which the people actually use, the growers actually use. And they did this on a weekly basis. So most of the activities that they carried out in controlling SWD within that period was actually done on a weekly basis. And that's why you have high, um, a high number of them using all those um, technologies on a weekly basis. To the left of my screen, sorry, to the right of my screen talks about the impact Sorry, the, the impact of the of these technologies on the severity of um, SWD. To a large extent, those technologies that were used, the early harvesting method, pick and destruction of um, infested fruit, clearing of bushes around farm, all these contribute to to a reduction in in, um, in the SWD population pressure, about 58 percent reduction in SWD. Uh, um, 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 population pressure on their farm. Talking about the larva infestation, we have a significant of uh, the larger percentage of, of that not having much impact on inf I mean, larva infestation, while on um, fruit rejection, almost all of the people actually indicated that um, there was um, a significant um, of, of impact reduction in fruit rejection. Why I'm being careful to use about the, to use the word significant at this point in time is that we don't actually conduct an in-depth analysis on using the differential statistics. So this is more of a just uh, of, of some bit of um, analysis of what data that we have as of now. So considering SW incidents of SWD on the farm within the past three years, since the inception of SPRI uh, projects, we had to ask this question. Did they experience SWD? within the past three years, now 98% of them said yes. So within 2008 and 20, uh, 20, 2020, sorry, 2023, there's been an increase in the, in the, in the incidences of SWD um, 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 infestation or appearances on growers' farm. But by and large, um, growers actually agreed that um, within this three period, uh, three year period between 2020 and 2023, there's been a significant increase in the insecticide um, um, application cost. And I think past of our um, earlier speakers, they've actually made references to that. And um, looking at um, um, increased labor cost, there's actually been a significant increase, in, uh, uh, sorry, substantial increase in the labor cost as well, as well as uh, um, uh, the crop, uh, low on crop infestation, there's been low on crop, uh, 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 the significant crop losses due to SWD. So by and large, looking at the um, various technologies that have been rolled out in time past, these growers are still using it and it's still having you know, a good impact on what uh, on, on their agronomic activities. Looking at the current um, technologies rolled out by these um, our researchers, we it's so interesting to know that um, a lot of these technologies are actually 
uh, uh, known by the growers. Many of them said they are aware of these technologies, talking about the drying traps, the wet traps, the labeling, um, uh, lava sampling methods, the native parasitoids, and also the exotic species that were actually introduced, which covers all the various aspects of the technologies rolled out by this research team. A lot of them actually have uh, confirmed that they are aware of the progress, but looking at the level of usage, it is low. And this could be for the fact that these are just new technologies getting, um, getting rolled out, so the adoption rate might still be low, except you have you know, the early adopters and the uh, innovators who are part of the tax grow um the tax force uh, members of this team you know picking up all these technologies and using on their grow uh, on their farm so you can see that as it is reflected on my on the left hand side of my on the right hand side of my screen so that shows the level of use of all these smps by these um, um our growers across the united states so looking at the effectiveness of the smp it shows um to a large extent that um these SMPs are actually working. The highest level um, um, uh, that was actually experienced was from salt and sugar solution, which was actually used for extraction of uh, lava sampling, which we have about 59% of those people saying they um, that really worked for them. And uh, talking about um, about 53% of the people actually used dry traps and they said it actually uh, moderately worked for them. So although this technology and um, this um, distribution actually shows that there are different levels of agreement of all of the effectiveness of these technologies in face of what we are experiencing on their field. But one thing that we cannot shy away from is that these are actually, all these technologies are helping growers on the farm you know, to reduce um, um, our SWD and to cope with these incidents. Looking at the impact of the uh, of the SMPs on reducing SWD, you know, um, the majority of them actually agreed to a large, um, to an extent that uh, there's been a, a low to moderate reduction in SWG population for on their farm, also on lava infestation as well as uh, food in, um, rejection. Sorry, my, my slide is not moving forward. Okay, oh no. Okay, considering the number of SMPs used by our, uh, our growers, it's so clear that um, there is none that is a maybe one size fits all among these technologies rolled out. Since some of them are aware, but they're not using it, that's why we have a total of numbers, you know, under zero there that they're not using. But there is always a, these growers actually combine one or more um, um, different strategies to actually combat this WD. And we have that the minimum, the majority of them actually combine at least two technologies to combat this WD on their farm. And looking at the characteristics of the of the SMPs, the majority of all uh, of the uh, of the responses that we have actually indicated that um, most of the technologies that they use. It is because of the heat of use of those technologies. And I, I, I think this is something that is laudable on part of the researchers coming up with technologies that are easy for growers to actually use and adapt to their farming activities. And um, another thing that was, was um, uh, common across uh, across board is the economy of it. This has to do with the prices of all these um, technologies. OK. Then looking at the at the factors that actually influence the the decision of the growers to actually adapt adapt some of these technologies, they one of the greatest factor is uh is um uh, the food quality. So whatsoever technologies your uh, growers will be watching out for is uh, technologies that are going to enhance or at the barest minimum maintain the food um, food qualities that they are having. Another thing that is of concern is the health and safety too, which um uh, I think um, one of our researchers actually made mention of that too earlier on. Then the urgency of uh, of mitigating SWG was something that actually um influenced their adoption decision to actually um um use some of these technologies to combat SWD. Well, um the efficacy of the system too plays a um a, a, a substantial role, you know, in um determining um, um, uh, what factors as a, as, a, as a factor determining the, this, their decision to adopt um, um, what, or one of these technologies is combating SWD on their on their farm.
Okay, so so far so go from the um from the results so far um the few recommendations that we have is that um it's clearly um evident from the research that um the efforts made by this research group it's yielding positive um um um, um results even on the field as growers are actually using things but there is need to actually enhance um the the, the the dissemination of these technologies to growers even out there even though some of them are aware of these technologies many of them are not using it so this could be um, there could be different factors which might be responsible for them not using these technologies that's beyond the scope of what we are actually doing at this point in time so i think one thing that is really, really important is how to you know cascade the findings from all our research efforts out there to grow us to be aware of and so that they can use. Second, since the combination of the, the management practices developed has actually um, uh, been um, helpful, then um, it's it, um, lay much uh, burden and uh, demand on the researchers to actually come with you know more targeted um, pro, uh, products that can help in con effectively controlling their subject so that growers will not have the reason to find in people like um, different technical um, 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 procedures, you know, to tackle SWD. And uh, finally, the factors to be considered when developing SWD, uh, sorry, SMPs, even beyond the scope of this, uh, uh, of this study, actually includes the ease of usage by growers, the advantages that those technologies actually offer, the price and also the efficacy of the of the pro, um, of the product, as well as um, the health and safety um, consideration of growers and also farm workers. So by and large, these are just part of the few um, findings that we've gotten from this survey. And like I said, we're still having in order, we're still conducting the survey is still active. So hopefully we hope to end um, the data collection in, in March this year so that we can have a robust, um, um, we can have all our data set pulled together and have a robust an in-depth analysis of that data set and that we can actually identify factors that actually significantly impact and influences the adoption and the usage of all these technologies by growers. So this is the, the final part of this of, of the slide. It has to do with the, the QR code that we shared with all our growers at different um, growers meeting and this was actually shared even as a um, ways as three ways of, of um, surveying email uh, of emails possible to solicit uh, growers' participation in this survey. And this was sent to about 30 growers' uh, association across the United States. So this is a QR code. Really appreciate it if um, some of our tech, uh, tax force members that are not taking it to just scan this QR code and partake in the, in the survey. And for as many um, growers that you know I'm around you, you could actually take this QR code, snap it, and give it to them for them to actually participate so that we can have their own um, voices. You know, um, documented and represented in the data set that we have. Thank you. Thanks, Kay and Dami, for a, a nice update on our survey efforts and impact evaluation uh, efforts that are going on. At this point, I would like to thank all of the team members uh, as well as stakeholders to for joining us for the meeting. I know it's uh, lots of hours and uh, everybody has busy schedules. So we really appreciate you taking time to join us and especially those who shared your observations with us. We really appreciate that. And at this point, we uh, have come to end of the agenda for today. Quick question, Ash, before you sure. wrap up. What yeah. is the agenda for tomorrow? What is it? Uh, Yes. So tomorrow the agenda is to do again, we will go objective by objective to uh, present plans for our research in, during the next year, this coming field season. And at the end, we will have time for stakeholders to provide feedback on the studies that we propose. Yeah, we'll, we'll again end with the stakeholder feedback and, and, uh, and then we will obviously incorporate those uh, stakeholder comments feedback to update our research plans for the next year. So it'll look look, it'll look pretty much the same as it, it did today in terms of order, but the focus will be on the plans rather than the uh, activities, the, the past activities. Same block of time? Uh, same, yeah. Same again, one to five will will likely end maybe 30 minutes or an hour before proposed time. 
if we can move through the agenda faster. All right, thank you again very much uh, for joining and we'll look forward to seeing everybody back again tomorrow. And you all at this point uh, have a good rest of the day, rest of the evening and please join back tomorrow. Thank you.